I began service as the interim national representative back uh, really one year ago this week. And uh, in serving in the role as interim national representative, I I am working to reestablish the uh, relationship with churches, uh, to represent them, to lead the fellowship, uh, to uh, to uh, oversee the RBM staff. Uh, there are about 30 people that work in our offices out of Chicago and really all over the country. A number of them work remotely, and they are really capable and competent people. I represent the fellowship. Uh, I traveled extensively. I spend one week per month, each uh, month uh, on site in Chicago. So I travel from Ankeny to uh, Chicago and then uh, since February I will have been in 47 churches, associations, conferences, colleges. So it's been very busy but it's, it has been a great delight and uh, really the most fun thing that I do and believe it or not doing what I do is a joy. It really is a joy to preach, to present the fellowship. Uh, the best thing I do is what I'm able to do today, to be able to be with the church and see what God has done and is doing to reach your community for Christ as you make disciples, and, and then to be able to be whatever encouragement I can to uh, the pastor as well as to the church family. I want you to know that you are among 1,200 other churches who love Christ, who believe the same as you do, who are all attempting to reach not not only their community, but their world for Christ. And they do that not merely as isolated churches, but rather as churches who have linked arms together. And often then we can really maximize and uh, leverage our resources to see that God can do uh, wonderful things in and through our individual church ministries. Um, John, just slip right to the, the first uh, slide for the message. Let me uh, have you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Let me get you, get you in the right chapter. How about that? And let's talk about a paradox today. And today, uh, in my pastoral ministry, I always took advantage of the Sundays preceding Christmas to preach uh, Christmas messages. So you are giving me that opportunity to do that this morning. So what are what what is a paradox? Well, it is not. If you should see the uh, and John, let me go ahead and just do that. Let me see if I can remember where I am. Uh, a paradox is not those. All right. <laughs> Uh, nor, nor is it these, all right? So that's not a paradox. A paradox is defined as a statement which seems to contradict itself or conflict with common sense, but indeed does contain a truth. For example, some of them might be more haste, less speed. Now, you youngins, you look this up. and You figure it out. Let, it, let these sink and perk through your mind. You'll figure them out eventually. More haste, less speed. Or, or perhaps slow down but accomplish more. Uh, or, or maybe uh, the old one, you gain by letting go. Sometimes we gain something by releasing it. Uh, or the old, hand, uh, the old one, a bird in hand is worth two in a bush. Now ask some of the older folks what in the world that means and you, you can figure it out. But that is a, indeed a paradox or perhaps the biblical paradox. This is really familiar and I think really important. He who finds his life shall lose it, but he who loses his life for my sake will find it. That is a paradox. That when we lose our life, that is when we release life from selfish pursuits and sinful pursuits, rather we believe Christ. It is then that we find life, really, quite, quite literally. I always find it interesting uh, that, uh, for example, have you, have you noticed the paradox of modern culture? Why, do, why does modern culture celebrate so vigorously Christmas season? It's the celebration of the coming of Christ for sinners, yet most of them don't have any knowledge of Christ. Why, why does the atheist, for example, use the year 2022? Now, he even uses sometimes common era, but nonetheless counted from the birth of Christ. Why does an atheist? That's a paradox. It just doesn't quite fit. Uh, Donald uh, Gray Barnhouse gave these eight, and I'm going to move through this very rapidly, so if you're writing in notes, you can fill these in. He gave these following eight contrasts or, parad uh, or uh, paradoxes of the, of the birth of Christ. Christ's birth was physical so that sinners might experience a, a spiritual birth. That's quite literally the essence of it. Christ was born in a stable that we might have a place in heaven. 
total difference of what heaven is like compared to that, that early stable. Christ became a man that we might become sons of God. He further notes, Christ became a slave that sinners might be free. Christ veiled his pre-incarnate glory so that we might be partakers of his glory. Christ was homeless so that we might have an eternal home. You remember the text, foxes have holes, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Shepherds rejoiced in the coming of Christ while angels rejoice over the coming of one sinner to repentance. And I know I'm moving fast, so um, ask Pastor John. He has the notes and he can give you if you miss any fill-ins. Christ died so that sinners might have eternal life. And so the, 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 the paradox indeed are, are many. It's the purity of an unwed mother. Now let that, think about that for a moment. And I don't know that we meditate through the birth narratives quite enough to realize what it happened when it was told to Mary, you will soon have a child. How can this be? I, I've never known a man. There was purity with an unwed mother. There was joy in a situation that normally would bring great pain. And a, a pregnancy apart from marriage. And, and that would normally bring great shame, and yet it brought great joy. And so the, the paradox really uh, are, are numerous. It's the paradox of Emmanuel. It is Matthew chapter 1. You will call his name Jesus. He is Emmanuel, God with us. The simple definition of Emmanuel is a paradox. God with us sinners. Just the essence of that. So the paradox of Emmanuel, God with us. That God, the Holy, the Just One, now living apart from sin with sinners. Our sin you understand. And I, I have, uh, did not put a picture up of them. I have nine grandchildren. Two of them are adopted by one of our daughters. Uh, we have, uh, those children are really beautiful children. Uh, I've seen some really beautiful young people around here. They're all in eighth place or later because my seven are, are, the, are the most beautiful of all. It's really interesting about my grandchildren, and it was true of my children. Uh, have you found this to be true? I did not need to teach my children how to be bad. The, the first word, my grandchildren. I, I love the word Papa. It's the best word in the English language. But the first word out of my grandchildren's mouth was not Papa. It was, no. I want what I want. I am a sinner. I am born in sin. I, want, I am the world. That's a child. Okay? Now, the bad thing is sometimes we adults act like that. <laughs> I am the world. Everything revolves around me. You see, the essence of who we are, the Bible, and if I were to begin to quote Scripture to you, they would be many. Uh, there is none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understands. There's none that seeks after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There's none that does good, no, not one. We are children of wrath, Paul says in Ephesians 2. We are born under sin. And so part of what I am, the very moment I enter this world, is that I am apart from God and I am depraved. And regrettably, as society removes its restraints, we see that in great flagrancy today, don't we? Uh, the, the various ways that humanity says, we'll show you what sin's like, <laughs> and my, do they? And I wish I could say that that never occurs in the church, but sometimes that even occurs in church where there is such flagrantly sinful behavior. And yet God with us holy, pure, righteous, eternal, immortal, invisible, only wise God. The, the God, remember, who uh, John in his prologue tells us, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. 
The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. So when we read the creation narrative, and God, uh, with an invisible hand, took dust of the ground, that was the Word, second person of the Trinity, Son of God, Jesus. And he breathed into him the breath of life and took a rib from Adam and fashioned Eve and breathed into them the breath of life and made them in his image. That's the eternal God, Son of God, who now is with us. Jesus, James Montgomery Boyce wrote, descended from the peak of glory to this lowly position in order to raise us from our lowly position to glory. And so with that in mind, I, all this to finally get to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Moreover, brethren, we made known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. May I be informal this morning? Pastor Woodford has already given you this. Would you give me the one word noun, not an adjective? One word noun for the word grace. That is not rhetorical. That is a real question. Forgiveness. Forgiveness might be a way of describing it, but it's not the best one word noun. What's the best one word noun for grace? Favor or kindness. Then if we put an adjective to it, now you, you elementary school children, you know what an adjective is, right? It's a, it's a, it's a describer. It's undeserved favor. And then it's uh, the undeserved favor seen best in the person Jesus Christ. Remember John 1. And if you can quote it with me, think with me the verses I quote it. John 1, 14. The Word was made flesh and He lived among us and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of what? Grace. Grace and truth. If you want to know what grace is, you look at the person. And you look at the person, Jesus, who is full of the kindness and favor of God, given in an undeserving fashion to sinners. Because you understand my seven beautiful grandchildren, or now my, now, now my nine, I've got to make sure to move from seven to nine. With the, They were just adopted last Monday, so the final adoption process just finished. So, so when I look at my nine grandchildren, in all of their loveliness, I, I understand that they deserve, even prior to consciousness, they deserve wrath from God because they are sinful. I am sinful, sold in my sin. God is just. He, he, he is holy, and He will exercise wrath upon sinners who are apart from Him. So when we think through grace, we think of the unmerited favor of God given in the person of Christ, who not only is grace in His person, but is grace in His death, because you want to know what grace looks best like. It's look at the cross of Calvary and see the blood pouring from His wounds. See Him raised on the cross of Calvary and see Him speaking to God saying, Why have you forsaken me? I'm being numbered as a sinner. I am bearing all of the wrath due every sin sinner from all time. You see, that's grace. This stretch of Scripture is all about grace, even though chapters 8 and 9 of 2 Corinthians are really about the question of giving. How do you give? What's the process of giving? So now with that in mind, let's go back to 2 Corinthians 8. We made known to you the grace of God that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. The real simple paraphrase of that, Paul is saying, you were really generous in giving, and that in a very difficult situation of affliction. You yourself are under duress, but you are giving to other churches. I like this text because now my ministry, my role, is on behalf of a fellowship of churches. The New Testament is never about simply one church. It's about one church helping another church. 
it's the Corinthians ministering in their giving to other churches. And so uh, we, we just see the interrelationship of churches. And so he says in verse 3, I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, beyond their ability, they were freely give, giving. You know, one of the great things that you can do is not only give, but give generously and even give sacrificially. And that's the image that is noted here in this text as the Corinthians gave. And he says, they didn't do this even as we hope, but verse 5 is one of my favorite texts on giving. See, giving is, we, we give to the Lord because we first previously given our life to Christ. He says, we, you did this not only as we hope, but you first gave yourselves to the Lord and then to us. So, so your money was kind of a, like an afterthought. Uh, you, you're giving to us because you have given yourself to the Lord. And he says in verse 6, so, so we've urged Titus that as he has begun, so he would complete this grace in you. As you abound in speech, uh, in the faith and knowledge, and you'll notice how grace abounds and permeates into all areas of life. He says you're abounding in the area of giving. And then what he does here is gives us a great text on Christmas Sunday, December 4th, 2022. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. So, so when we're thinking through this text, we've already identified grace, but let's see the poor become rich through the poverty of the richest. So, let's take that part, who are the poor? And I, and I want to say, it's me. I, I am poor because I am a sinner. Uh, do you remember what was called, the, the, I think they still uh, sell them. If, do you know what a magic slate is? It's that little black thing that with the acetate on front, you can write on it. And so if I began to write all of my sins on really, really small printing, uh, how much black would there be on that acetate? Well, pretty soon it would be filled solid black. Can you hear the when you pull it up? Uh, you see, I, I'm sinful. The, the poor are sinners. It's you. I, I, I don't want to insult you, but I, I want you to understand that all of us sitting here today naturally are sinful. When I hop, I just had my annual physical. When I hop up on the doctor's table and he checks my reflexes, my 68-year-old reflexes, uh, I, you, you, you hop up on the spiritual table and, and he hits your spiritual knee. Guess what your reflex always is? It's to sin. When you're out on the highway... I've often noted, it's, uh, sinfulness seems to express itself really clearly on the highway. When someone cuts you off, does a really stupid thing, your first response is not to say, oh, God bless you, go, go your way. Uh, at least it's not my first response. See, because my reflex is a sinful reflex. The poor are sinners. They're human beings. I, I, I would remind myself, uh, as I did this morning early, God, today I stand accepted before you, but I'm a sinner forgiven by the grace of Christ. What is the wealth they receive? Well, they receive forgiveness of sins. There are many, many blessings of knowing Christ. I, I don't know of any better blessing thinking of all the sins I've ever committed. <laughs> Some of them are small and obscure, known only to me. Some of them are pretty glaring and known, open to others. To know that because Jesus died for my sins and he brought me to faith in Christ, every sin I've ever committed is forgiven. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us those of us who know Christ. I would further remind myself that there's the removal of condemnation. There's no fear of wrath. Um, perhaps you've watched an unsaved person die with no hope. And, and they're 
You can mask it any way you want, but there is the presence of fear. Even those that deny consciously the presence of God have this knowledge of God planted in their heart and when they approach uh, physical death there inevitably is the sense of fear to know that now in Christ God removes fear there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus Romans 8 1 <laughs> that, that's a good thing and then God gives us himself <laughs> uh, I, Debbie and I now have been married 46 years uh, we, we've arrived at the point where uh, all of our Christmas giving, uh, we don't get each other Christmas gifts. Uh, it's just has become our pattern. <laughs> we, give, we give rather lavishly to our grandchildren, <laughs> a little bit to our children. Uh, and why have we done that? Because well, we've already given ourselves to the other person. Everything she has, everything that's mine is hers. She doesn't have to ask me if she can spend our money because I, it's, it's all hers. Everything she has is mine. You know the best thing that God gives us? He gives us himself. 1 Peter 3.18 Christ, the righteous one, died for the unjust for this purpose that he might bring us to God. The greatest truth is that God reconciles sinners to himself. And he brings them to himself. It's not all of the blessings. It's not the golden streets. It's not a mansion in heaven that is the blessing of eternal life. It's the blessing that God gives us himself. And I think we ought to meditate on that. He gives us himself. Who are the richest? Well, the, the richest is Christ. He is the eternal Son. He has no rivals. He truly is the greatest. Um, I, I, I've played athletics for all of my life. I, I, I'm an old-time basketball player. I kid about that. I played when, when men were men and shorts were shorts. Um, I get better in my mind every year. <laughs> Uh, they, they, they debate about who's the best basketball player ever. Who's the best ever? Some would say Michael Jordan. I would say Bill Russell. I, I, who's, who's the greatest ever? You, you know the greatest ever still missed foul shots? Still committed fouls? Uh, humanly, there, there's yet flaw. Do you understand that there is a person who is immortal, who is who possesses all power, who is everywhere present in the totality of existence at every moment, that he knows everything, that he has never decided anything, that his wisdom is eternal, that he has no limits whatsoever. I mean, can you imagine the word speaking um, how many of you ladies would like to do that? Go home today. I don't know if any of you have teenagers. All right, you've got a teenager. And you're going to go home, walk in the house. It's Stephen, was that your name? You're 15, right? Excuse me, don't fall here. So go home to Stephen, excuse me. Um, and you ladies would say, room, be clean. <laughs> I mean, how, wouldn't you like that? <laughs> no vacuum, no dust cloths, no labor, no effort. You just, just need to think it, and it happens. Uh, Grandma, I don't know if you can do that with Stephen's room, whether you can try that. No doubt Stephen's room does not need to be cleaned. How, how, what's the condition of the room this morning? Did you make your bed this morning? Oh, good for you. <laughs> Can you imagine the word of God making Adam merely by stating it? Fashioning from Adam, Eve, and making a woman who speaks and flings the worlds into space. And then... He speaks of the world. Oh, I just prop my feet up on the world. It's just my footstool. It's just a <laughs> There's no limit to God. He is the wealthiest 
that could ever be imagined. There's, there, there's no limit to who he is. He is the eternal son. And what is his poverty? Well, first he became humanity. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. And part of that poverty was he became human. Not merely, by the way, a body. Body, so spirit. So that he could know the pain, for example, of uh, Mary and Martha when their best friend Lazarus, when his best friend Lazarus died. <coughs> And he could, he could go to the Garden of Gethsemane and say, Lord, this... You understand there's nothing difficult for God. But that God in flesh would go to the Garden and say, if it's possible, Lord, this event of the cross that will soon occur, if it's possible, could, could, could we somehow bypass this event called the cross? And realizing that that could not happen. That the eternal God who could merely, who was everywhere present in the totality of existence in every place needed to walk from point A to point B. Uh, he humbled himself, Paul says in Philippians 2, in being fashioned as a man. So the ultimate humility is that he became human fully human. And we understand the importance of that, don't, don't you? An angel could not die for human beings. Only another human being could be a substitute for human beings. This is the poverty of Christ. And further, he then was numbered as a transgressor. Um... He, in his own body, bore our sin at Calvary, Peter says. He was numbered as a sinner. To think through the events of Calvary, that God the Father, loving his Son, equal with him as the Father and the Son, and yet would, in the words of Isaiah the prophet, would bruise him, would put him to grief, would take all of the fury of his wrath and hold none of that back and place all of the judgment due all humanity from all time and do that in the hours of the cross. You see, he was numbered as a sinner. God held nothing back from his wrath in, in the events of the cross. See, that's the poverty of of Christ. Christ was rich, yet became poor for us. He is the eternal Son. He became man. He impoverished himself that we might become rich. And further, see, we've already noted this. He became man. He became sin for us. And look in your text to make sure that we note this. This is not merely my words, but rather the words of God. <clears throat> for you know the grace of our <clears throat> Lord Jesus, that though he was rich, yet what are the next words, that prepositional phrase? For your sakes. This is not an abstract idea. He, he points to the Corinthian people and he says, Jesus did this for you. In your place. The logic implicit in this statement is too obvious. If he did this all for me, and of course, remember the context. He's talking about the context of the Corinthians uh, giving financial offerings to assist beleaguered believers. The logic, however, is implicit. If Jesus did all that for me, then nothing I give or do can be too much for him. 
His love, His grace constrains me. I am redeemed at an infinite cost. I am no longer my own. All that was mine is now His. Please understand here the, 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 the great condescension that He did this for our sakes. The poor become rich through the poverty of the riches. So, I, I, I do want to try to have you think and respond. I don't make the presumption that everyone present here knows Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. My own personal testimony, I came to Christ as a 10-year-old boy. I was raised in a church like Good News Baptist Church. I heard the gospel from the first day I was born and heard it literally hundreds and hundreds of times and never responded to it. I just never sensed the reality of it. Until finally one day, by God's grace, there, there, there came that overwhelming sense that I am a sinner. <laughs> I'm headed for hell. And here is what God did for me in the person of Christ. So, so what, what then, how can or how should we respond to this gracious gift? Well, we respond with faith. I know many today have expressed that faith. <laughs> And that's a wonderful thing. And even the faith we express is a gift from God. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing from what? Hearing from the ministry of the Word of God. Paul speaks of being quickened in our deadness, in our sin. But believe, perhaps today you do not know Christ, and you need to express faith in Jesus Christ. That's really simple. It's not, the, it's not a formula. It's not a, a unique prayer, we say, but it's understanding all that I am. I can remember sharing Christ with a hard-bitten, I call him a beer and a whiskey kind of guy. He was a, he was a UAW worker. Uh, I witnessed to him over a series of months, led Bible studies with him, uh, urged Gene to trust Christ. And, and, and so he finally came to the day where he wanted to trust Christ. Now you don't, with a union auto worker, you don't tell him what to do. So I said, Gene, we well, just need to talk to God and, and ask him to save you. And so in his living room, quite literally for five minutes, I wasn't going to give him a prayer. I said, Gene, you need to talk to God and, and ask Him to save you. I mean, five minutes of silence, quite literally, while he tried to figure out what to say and how to say it to ask God to save him. I don't remember what the words were, but there was a sincere expression of, God, I'm a sinner. You know, I look back on my life, I have such great regret, sorrow, Look at all the sin, all the damage, all the things that I thought were full of joy, but now they're painful, they're difficult, they brought ruin to my life and to the lives of others. That was such a stupid way to live. I don't know what in the world I was thinking. And, and now I see Christ, who, who is the immortal, eternal Son of God who became flesh and died for my sins. Look at what He did for me. He, he bore my wrath. And so I take His death as mine. I, I ask you to forgive me because of what Christ did. Somehow that idea is what faith is. So, so believe. I would further encourage you to... Uh, Adore him. Uh, we, uh, we we don't use the word adore much. Um, come, let us adore him. Uh, later on in this text, if I could preach longer, I would take you all the way to the end of uh, of of Second Corinthians nine, where he says, "Oh, thanks be to God for His." It's a gift that we can't even describe it. It's so magnificent in, in, in what God has done in saving us. Give Him your adoration. Uh, give Him your life. Um, every part. Uh, give Him your service. Your grateful service. I, I, I know, I think marriage is really a wonderful institution, of course. It's why God likens the relationship of Christ and the church to marriage. 
now, now Debbie and I are not perfect husband and wife. I've been known to be crass and cranky at times. That's, you know, way long ago. But, you know, but quite literally, after 46 years, uh, in my good moments, Debbie could ask me anything. And quite literally, I would do it for her. I, because I love her. She has given herself to me. What would we withhold from the God who has gone to such great lengths to save us? What would we dare withhold? What would we want to withhold? But rather to give him our life and our service. Is it too much to give our money, our time, our talents, our lives? Is it too, too much to ask, to, to even ask a rebellious sinner to trust Christ? So, are you poor today? Then, then you need to trust Christ. Uh, if you are rich, then give Christ your love, your adoration, your service. Christmas is really a wonderful season of time. I, I have many favorite Christmas carols. We've sung a couple of them today. Uh, some of you may know. Uh, you know the old Christmas carol? Uh, In the bleak midwinter, frosty wind did moan. Earth stood hard as iron, water like a stone. <laughs> Describes winter in Iowa, doesn't it? Snow had fallen, snow on snow, fallen snow on snow in the bleak midwinter many years ago. <laughs> Heaven cannot hold him, nor the earth sustain. Heaven and earth shall flee away when he comes to reign. God himself became a man, born to pay sin's price. He's the great Redeemer, our Lord Jesus Christ. Now especially the third verse. What can I give him? Poor as I am. If I were a shepherd, I would bring a lamb. If I were a nobleman, I would do my part. Yet what can I give him? Give him my heart. Father, thank you for the Savior. Thank you for your goodness to us. For this day, we're very grateful. Help us to know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich yet for our sakes he became poor that we through his poverty might become rich do that great work in our hearts today by your word and spirit we pray this in Jesus name